What a privilege it is to be able to open God's Word and, and learn from His Word. Um, I was watching a, a short um, sermon this morning. I, I like to get up, I don't know, I'm, the older I'm getting, the less I sleep, and the more early I wake up in the morning. I'm, I'm always been a morning person, but this, uh, this morning I, I uh, put on YouTube, and we've got this thing called Chromecast, so you, from your phone you can cast it onto the TV, and you can watch it on a big screen, and this guy was, was speaking about um, the Gospel of Mark, and he was, he was talking about how, um, how Mark was, was actually like a, um, a secretary to Peter. So Peter would, would, would dictate, and, 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 and John Mark would, would write down. And, and uh, I don't know about you, but when I've written down things of what I've done in the past, or, or people close to me have done, and, and, and I put it in words, somehow something happens, you, you kind of, it's, 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 it, it really establishes it within your heart, and you think, wow, they, you know, this, this really did happen. This, um, you know, a lot of things happens in our minds, and we kind of like, after a while, did it happen or didn't happen? But yeah, we've got God's word written down for us um, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which reminds us of exactly what the disciples got up to. Now, at the best of times, when you read um, memoirs, when people write memoirs down, it's from a very biased point, point of view. It's a very clinical look at their life, and it's, it's, it's usually written to make the person look good, to make the person look really, really good. And so, and so it's, 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 it's so sobering to be able to turn to the Gospel of Mark and see this book, these 16 chapters, and see how it's not clinical. To see how people, um, it's recorded that people failed. It's recorded that, that things were done in such a way that, that, that God would have his plans be revealed to humankind. So please turn in your Bibles to um, the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest of the Gospels, and, and because we also haven't really gone through a Gospel, I think it's a, it's a really good idea for us to wade through this. And um, if you look in the bulletin, week after week, it shows what we, which passages we'll be going through. So if I can encourage you, as you read through it, um, with the week leading up to uh, the sermon, um, it'll, it'll uh, give you an opportunity to then look into Scripture, and then maybe go over and look at some cross-references to other Gospels. Uh, Gospels and see how they've put that situation. Obviously, the, the four Gospels were ref, uh, written to totally different audiences, and Mark, in his Gospel, writes to the people in Rome. Now, you can imagine Rome is this place, uh, they, they, they call it Babylon. That's the code word for, for Rome. It's, it's a place where, where there, is, is so, there are so many uh, slaves walking the road, slaves that have been freed, slaves that are still under house arrest, slaves that are still, um, they've got their mark. A lot of the slaves were actually branded as to which house they belong to. So they would have these marks on them, and, and they would walk down the road, and at any time, a soldier or a person could grab their, their tunics and pull it up and, and see who they belong to and see if they were in the right place that they had to be. And so, yeah, you also think of, 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 of the mark that Jesus left on his disciple. It wasn't a physical mark, it was a spiritual mark. It was a mark on their hearts that would so um, uh, exude the gospel in every way possible that people would be able to not even look at their tunic or not even look at the brand that would be on their arm or wouldn't be on their arm, but they would see by their lifestyle who they belonged to. Now, it was common practice in those days for men to, be, to, to, to go down to the local drinking holes. I suppose nothing has changed much <laughs> in the world today. But also, they had, they had places of ill repute, brothels that they would frequent all the time. They would have orgies that they would go crazy on. And this was life. And, and Christians were being sucked into that life very, very early on in, in, in um the way of, of uh, Christianity. And so, yeah, Mark, through Peter, is writing down 
the account of, of, of Jesus Christ, of his life, of, of how he walked when he was on this earth, as, as every day he encountered people. Every day he encountered people that were either, either slaves to a, a master or slaves to sin. Most of all, slaves to sin. And he wanted to show them back then, but us or, or now as well, that there is a better way. And this way is, 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 is not just a, a way that has been thumb sucked out of somebody's um, uh, experience, but, but has been imp uh, imparted by the Holy Spirit to men who were able to write it down. So we know that, that it was written to people in Rome. People were going through a tough time. You can imagine it, that, that the emperors then were considered gods, and yeah, you had Christianity that was, was pointing to Jesus and saying, no, there is only one, and that's Jesus, the one that walked this earth, the one that, that, that uh, um, was, was alive and, and, and yet murdered and then, and then back alive, and people would say, but that is bizarre. How is that even possible? And so Mark wrote them down. So have a look at the first verse there, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Who is the book about? Who is this book about? Well, it says it's good news. Good news, glad tidings, uh, heralded everywhere. It's good news. This is news that, that, that would free the slave, the slave to sin, free any slave from what they were doing. Who was it about? Well, it was about Jesus, of Na uh, Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah? The one that's foretold, that, 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 that was foretold of, of in the Old Testament. The one that would come to save us. Messiah had this, this incredible uh, thought pattern of somebody that would ride in on this beautiful white stallion. Wielding a sword. Relieving them from the Roman rule. That was the, 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 the thought that would, come, that would come to mind straight away. So he was to be the Messiah. But something else which is even more dramatic than being a Messiah, he was the Son of God. How is it possible that, that, that God would be able to dwell on this earth and not be tainted by sin? And not just God, but the Son of God. Somebody who, who, who was in flesh form. Somebody who, who would walk the roads and, 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 and be able to be with us. The very Son of God. Let's move down to verse 2 and 3. Well, who foretold of the Messiah? Obviously, the Old Testament is replete in, in, in um, uh, uh, understandings of, of who this Messiah would be. But if we have a look at, at just two of them, one is um, Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5. It says, a voice is calling um, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the desert, uh, in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain be made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Yet God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, one is coming. This man is coming to be this incredible savior of the world. And he's not going to come as you expect. He definitely is not going to come as you expect. If you just think of it for a moment, imagine seeing a valley. Seeing a valley that is all of a sudden raised up and a mountain that's all of a sudden made low. That would be a plain. That would be just a, 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 a plain that would level out before us. Rough ground shall become level and rugged places a plain. God is, is going to come and make everyone equal. He's coming to show a new way that would level everything, absolutely everything for both you, yourself and, and myself. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. When Christ Jesus came, the glory of God was, was embodied in humanity, in the form of a man. And it says, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Malachi 3 verses 1 to 3 says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Obviously speaking about John. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. 
The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who was ready for that day? I don't know if you can think back to when you weren't a believer, when you still walked the roads and, and, and did things that were so anti-God. Who could endure the day of the Lord? As God broke into your life, as he, as he transformed your heart from, from that of, of something of stone to something of clay, something dramatic occurred. Who can endure that day? Who can endure the day when, when God tapped you on the shoulder and, and introduced you to his son, the one that can take away sin? Who can endure? And Malachi goes on. He says, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like the refiner's fire and the launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. I don't know about you, but can you imagine being, being made clean? I know, um, they st I think they still do it, or they used to do it, was when prisoners came from a different land um, and, they, and they locked them up. They would scrub them first. They would get them and they would brushes and they would, they, would, they would scrub them clean and then, then de-louse them and, and, and all kinds of things and, and, and make them as clean as possible. I can just imagine Jesus standing before God wanting to clean the nation through himself, wanting to take that soap of the Holy Spirit and wash us absolutely clean, take away every sin. And that's what Jesus would be doing. And this is Malachi, the last uh, Old Testament prophet in the Old Testament. Um, they say that John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet, but this is in, 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 in the canon itself. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. As we come week in and, or every second week and we have the Lord's Supper, we go through a process of, of, of soul searching, of looking at ourselves, of, 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 of asking God, well, Lord, would you please remove my sin? We'll, and we confess our sin. We come before God and we say, Lord, this is what we've done wrong. Would you now refine me? Would you burn away all the dross, burn away all the, all, all, all the stuff that would not make me pure? Would you burn it away? And that's what Jesus came to do. The very Son of God came to burn all of sin away. Repentance is an incredible thing. Recognition of sin and confession of sin and asking for repentance before the Lord is a monumental thing. I know some people believe that we go once and then it's done for all time. Then you don't have to ask for forgiveness. No, it's a constant thing that we keep going back and going back and going back and speaking to God and asking him. Cleaning our hearts before the Lord. Putting it, as it were, on the altar for him to deal with. And that's exactly what Malachi is saying. He's saying somebody who we won't be able to stand before, that we could fall on our faces before because he's so amazing, will come and he will refine us. He will look into your very heart and he will touch things that are sinful in your life. He will burn away any desire that's there. And if he doesn't burn it away and you want to hold on to it, well, then he's not Lord of your life. Isn't it incredible that, to think that 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah made this prophecy? 700 years. That is incredible. And yet we have the fulfillment. Mark now lines it, lays it out before us in the book of Mark to show us just who Jesus is. Well, who prepared the way for Jesus? Look at verses four to eight. Well, it's his cousin, John. John was there. He, he's in the desert, in the wilderness, like, like right away from everybody, far away from, from the cities. He wanted to get away from the, the contamination that the city is. If he'd just gone into the city and proclaimed, I don't think anything would have happened. He had to move away and get away from it all. 
He wanted them to see that, that just as he's in the wilderness, just as, as, as things are, 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 are deserted, that's how we are without God. Our hearts are deserted. Our hearts are like a desert, barren, nothingness. He came to foreshadow what Jesus would do. Can you imagine this guy with, with, with camel hair clothing? That must have been so itchy. I tell you what, I put certain things on and I scratch like crazy, but camel hair, and he ate locusts dipped in honey. Man, you talk about halitosis. That guy's breath must have really stank. But here's this guy who's totally against every constabulary that, that there was, against absolutely everything, in the desert where there's no towns, where there's nothing but wild animals, dressed like, like I don't know what, but proclaiming, Repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn back, turn away from your evil ways. Look to God, God will save you. One is coming, coming that's far greater than I am and he's coming to forgive sins. Jesus came so that we could confess our sin, so that we could have forgiveness of sin, so that a burden would be lifted from our shoulders, and that's what John did. This cousin of Jesus, repent, repent. Next, we see Jesus' baptism, Mark 1, 9 to 11. Jesus came from Nazareth to be baptized by John. And, and I can just imagine John. John is, is heralding this Messiah that's coming. And then all of a sudden he sees him right in front of him. And as the other gospels talk, they say that, that, that John said, no, you should baptize me. And Jesus says, to fulfill all righteousness, we must do it as God intended it. Whenever I meet with people who want to get baptized, they say to me, Bruce, what's a good reason for being baptized. And all I say is that you're fulfilling all righteousness. Believe and be baptized. It's being obedient. And that's exactly what Jesus was. He was obedient to the Father. So he came to John to be baptized, to go under the water. He didn't need a cleansing from sin, not like us, but he was our example. He wanted to show us how we should go about repenting of our sin and being baptized. He came to fulfill scripture. But more importantly than that, he came to show the unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At that very moment when he's baptized and he comes out of the water, what do we see happen? The Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove comes down and a voice from heaven proclaims, this is my Son, in him I am well pleased. Can you imagine being there? being baptized and you've got all these people all over the place coming to hear John and then all of a sudden you see this man come out of the water and this dove as it were come down and this voice booms this is my son in him I am well pleased if ever there was a confession of who Jesus Christ is it was at that time the very Son of God in flesh, there in, in front of everybody, open for everybody to see. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect unity. Perfect unity like never before. We have no idea the unity of those three, but here we've got the picture. So then what happens? What happens to Jesus then? Well, Mark is, 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 is the, the book of Mark is, a, is an account of, of then this happened, then that happened, then immediately. And the words there are immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. See, here we've got Jesus' confirmation of who he is. Here we've got Jesus, uh, Lamb of God. We, and then we've got Jesus driven into the desert. 40 days and 40 nights, fasting, hungry, weak, frail. Matthew 4 verse 3 says, 
the tempter came to him and said. He's there in that place and he's so vulnerable, so vulnerable. And who comes along but the tempter himself? Jesus was face to face with Satan. Satan was looking at him square in the eye. I don't know about you, but when I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, I'm cranky. (laughs) I'm really cranky. I need a good steak. (laughs) And and, and, and people mustn't come and give me grief because then all hell breaks loose. But just Jesus, 40 days without eating, weak, vulnerable, and Satan comes and tempts him straight away. Well, how did Jesus overcome Satan? Did he just call down his father and say, Father, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, you deal with it. No. His humanity was very much part of his deity as well. You couldn't divide the two. He used scripture to overcome Satan. And that's a blueprint for us. When we were in the, 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 the very throes of Satan taking us and sifting us and tempting us, Scripture is the answer. Scripture is the very answer. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Now this is speaking The writer to the Hebrews is speaking of Jesus, the high priest, the one that would not only stand and and, and be the priest, but would be the sacrifice as well. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. So even though Satan came at this very vulnerable time of Jesus' ministry, he did not waver, was without sin. And because he's been in that state, because he's, he's been there where he could have sinned, where it was a possibility, we can now know what to do when we are tempted. When we are faced with any kind of temptation, we know where to go. We know who to turn to. And we know that the one that we turn to, Jesus Christ, has been there, has done it, and is without sin. But then look at verse 16. Verse 16 is our response. That is our response. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of our need. Can you see there that we look to Jesus as he went through those temptations, as he faced Satan head on, we can do exactly the same because he did it. We can have confidence in the grace that God gives us moment by moment. As we, as, as we face these temptations, he will give us mercy, he will give us grace to help us in our time of need. Where do you stand at the moment when temptation comes? What has happened to you when temptation comes? What would you do? I know it's sometimes we just give in. Sometimes we think it's too hard. Sometimes we think, oh God, you will understand. <coughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna give in. After all, God is a God of mercy and is a God of grace. So he's gonna forgive me. I'm just going to relent. I'm just going to give in. This is too hard. But you see, that's not what Jesus did. Looking at us today, way back then, and for all of humanity, he took a stand and he said, I will not give in. And it's easy for us to give in. It's easy for us to say, well, they don't know what I'm going through. They don't know the troubles that I've I've, I've gone through. They don't know my husband. They don't know my wife. They don't know my kids. They drive me crazy. (laughs) Who can relate? (laughs) 
So what is our response? What do we take into this, this week from this, these 13 verses that we have in the book of Mark? Well, know that this letter, this letter that's written through the words of Peter that John Mark wrote down is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man. That he was not just a, a, a God that came down that was stayed God, but he was fully God, fully man. That we can take that the, the, the very person who was there at creation came and walked this earth to show us a better way. You can rely on Jesus. You can take the words of Scripture and you can rely on them. Every promise we've just seen in, in the book of Isaiah, that 700 years before the actual event, Isaiah prophesied it, and it came true. Number two, God has a plan. Nothing takes him by surprise. Where you are right now, God knows your circumstance. It does not take him by surprise. He's not scurrying around looking for plan B or C or D or G. He knows where you are right now, and he sees your heart, and he knows what you're about. Number three, true confession of sin leads to forgiveness. Some people say, well, well you, just, you, you just like accept Jesus, accept Jesus. No, no, there's a confession that needs to happen. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we have to come before the very throne of grace, before God's holy, holy throne in front of Jesus Christ and confess our sin. We've got to say, Lord, this is what I did. That's what I did. Name it. Tell him he wants to know. He needs to know. He deserves to know. And once you've done that, ask him for forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. Confession of sin leads to forgiveness. Fourthly, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are actively involved in the world today as at the baptism of Jesus. Know that that, that wasn't a, a one-time affair. You see, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were active at creation. You can see throughout the Old Testament, God the Father and God the Son is actively involved. Even the Holy Spirit comes down for a time and then goes again. But then with the New Testament, we've got the Holy Spirit then living, active in people's lives. At Pentecost, we see the Spirit come down and inhabit us. So at, 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 at conversion, when Christ breaks into your life, something dramatic happens. As we confess our sin, God's Spirit cleans us out and His Spirit takes place. It's his place in our hearts. We become the temple of God. God reigns in us. That's why this is such an important place. God wants to reign in each one of us. God is active in his word. Christ is active in his word. The Holy Spirit is active in the word because it illuminates what the word is and shows us how to be obedient to the Father. And then finally, Jesus gives us a blueprint on how to deal with Satan and sin. He is both the high priest and the sacrificial lamb. And you kind of think, how is it possible that somebody can be both? That, that, that the high priest can sacrifice himself to appease God's wrath and to set us free. Well, that was the only way. If that didn't happen, we could not be in this place that we are of incredible grace, incredible mercy before the throne of God. Forgiveness of sin is only found in and through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you have found forgiveness of your sin any other place, I'm sorry, you are in the wrong gospel. You are in the wrong good news because then it's not good news because then it's man-centered. It's what I can do for myself. It's about me relieving my, my own sin and you cannot do that. Tell me something, when, when, when forgiveness is sought, who's the hardest person to forgive? It's yourself. Doesn't that haunt you sometimes when you've done something 
And even though somebody has forgiven you, or people have forgiven you, and they've pushed it to one side, there's that war that goes on, not only in our hearts, but our minds. And we can't forgive ourselves. We can't move past that point. But Jesus says, I have come to set the captives free. That ransom that sin has on you, he's come to do away with that ransom, to pay it through his own body, through his own blood, for your freedom. Where do you stand today? Where do you stand? Do you stand in freedom or do you stand in condemnation? We read earlier, now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are firmly in the hands of Jesus Christ, if your sins are forgiven, if the Holy Spirit lives in your heart and reigns in your life, you have nothing to fear. Nothing whatsoever. Don't let Satan get into your mind. 1 Corinthians talks about take every thought captive and bring it under subjection to Christ. Those thoughts sometimes that, are, that, that, that drive you crazy. Satan wants to get into your head and he wants to assure you that you are not saved. We can go all the way back to the garden for that. Did he really say? <laughs> Satan is so clever and he gets in our heads. What is your response today? Are you going to take God at his word? Are you going to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I will accept your forgiveness and I will remove this from my thoughts and my thinking and my ways to move on to be obedient to your call? Only you can make that decision and only you can live in victory of what Jesus has done. Can I encourage you next week um, or the, during this week to read um, right until the end of, the, of, of, of chapter one, we'll be looking at the next part. And so we're gonna try and go through Mark quite quickly. We'll do five, five chapters or five sessions. Then we'll go to the book of um, James and we'll deal with the book of James and then we'll come back to Mark again. So um, yeah, prepare yourself, uh, come well read up, um, read the book of Mark, read it over and over and over, let it become part of you. Acknowledge what Christ has done, th- done for you through his sacrifice. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I know it's so hard that we can't forgive ourselves. Sometimes we lay so much guilt and blame and even though you've forgiven us, help us to be assured of our salvation. Help us to be assured of, 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 of what you've done in our lives. <coughs> oh Lord, thank you that we are able to go to the book of Mark and, and read of who you are, the very son of God who came to forgive sin. Lord, help us as we go into this week. Give us strength to be able to fight against the evil one through your word and help us, Lord, day in and day out to know that we belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.